Well, um, good afternoon. I welcome all to this very interesting um, roundtable two, Emerging Science, Frontier Technologies and the SDGs. This roundtable echoes um, and follows up on the conceptual and uh, regulatory framework derived from previous efforts to understand and monitor the impact of technological change on sustainable and inclusive development. This topic, I must say, is very close to my heart because I fought for many years and I participated in persuading several governments of the need and the content of uh, the conceptual uh, and regulatory framework described in the notes uh, to this uh, round table. We have entered the phase of um, visibly faster technological progress in its uh, scope, its speed, efficiency, um, decreasing marginal costs, uh, uh, capability, scalability, and uh, synergy between technologies. Um, sensitizing decision makers, as the uh, uh, notes say, and bringing them closer to the increasingly strong, diverse, and fractal pulse of uh, scientific and technological progress is crucial to prevent the worst and take advantage of the best of traditional and frontier technologies uh, and innovations. Unfortunately, there has been little research on its impact on the global south and even in developed countries and vulnerable communities within them. Um, as UNCTAD's uh, Excellent Technology and Innovation Report 2021 argues, technological waves come upon us ever faster, disrupting global and national economies and societies in many varied ways. Well, we should continue updating and spreading these type of research and findings. The question is, how can we move forward and do so soon? I will now give the floor to the list of uh, presentations, panelists and other contributors in agreement with the program and times indicated. They are many uh, uh, presenters, so we must stick to the, to the time. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Dr. Maria Francesca Spatolizano. She is Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination and Interagency Affairs, DESA, and OIC of the Office of the Secretary General. Uh, I'm very happy to see you again, uh, Dr. Spatolizano. Uh, please, you have the floor. My great pleasure indeed. And uh, co-chairs, excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank the Secretary General's 10 member group, the Interagency Task Team and all engaged TFM partners for their efforts. It is an honor for me to present to you today the updated TFM findings on the impact of rapid technological change on the achievement of the SDGs. These findings represent a collaborative multi-stakeholder achievement based on cumulative learning for years. Scientists and engineers from academia, NGOs, private sector and the UN system have contributed, including through virtual meetings and policy briefs. This year, many science policy briefs were received. 64 of them passed the peer review process and have been included in the 2022 report of the Interagency Task Team on Emergency Science, Frontier Technologies and the SDGs. I would like to especially thank colleagues from DESA, UNCTAD, ECE, ESQUA, ESCAP, ITU, ILO, UNF, UNIDO, UNESCO, UNU, World Food Program, UNOSA, UNDP, WIPO, and the World Bank for their very substantial contributions. Workstream 10 of the Interagency Task Team spearheaded these efforts, bringing together lead authors from relevant flagship publications across the UN system. Ladies and gentlemen, a little history to help put uh, things in the context. 
Three years ago, this forum celebrated rapid technological change and its potential for accelerating progress towards the SDGs. And it looked at the wider societal and development impacts of emerging technologies and how to make institutions fit for rapid change. However, we experienced multiple shocks and crises in the last two years. And they have not only set back the world in its progress towards sustainable development, but they also served as a painful uh, stress test. COVID-19 provided a reality test for visions of digital and AI-driven societies. While it showed new ways for speeding up innovation and changing behaviors, it also left behind billions of people in all countries. After all, almost the 3 billion people remain unconnected, as you know. Last year, the task team called for replicating the massive drive for COVID vaccines, also for the 20 neglected tropical diseases, which continue to affect 1 billion people. So it is clear to me, our collective efforts on science, technology, and innovation for sustainable development are more important than ever. Now, let me briefly recap some of this year's TFM findings. First, the 2019 and 2021 TFM findings remain valid, but new elements are necessary. Second, there are critical institutional gaps to be filled to support modern innovation systems. Among others, proposals have been put forward for the creation of a network of banks of ideas and funds for innovation led by autonomous ethical councils, as well as for a network of impact entrepreneurs and for advisory services. A third finding, many existing engineering codes and standards are not adequate to address uh, a changing climate. The global engineering profession should review and update them and scale up capacity building. The UN might want to consider formally recognizing the role of engineering standards for the SDGs. Fourthly, the next high-tech waves emerging from the basic research labs and rapidly remaking development models. Much greater funding is needed for basic research and university industry collaboration. Large corporations are increasingly in the lead. International innovative cooperation initiatives are needed to support joint demonstration projects by companies and public institutions. A fifth point, entirely new products and services with new characteristics are emerging that require specific regulatory and policy solutions. And for example, deep neural networks now surpass human cognitive capabilities in narrow tasks. Unbeknownst to many, narrow AI has become ubiquitous in many countries, but billions remain excluded from its benefits. In this regard, scientists need to develop accessible scenarios and define long-term goals to support global policymaking. At the UN level, recent UNESCO recommendations on the ethics of artificial intelligence and on open science are very notable. Some even argue for a new manifesto for science, technology, and innovation. Sixth, a major international effort is proposed to deploy and synthesize technology and scientific data for providing a real-time global picture in support of decision making on climate change, SDGs, and human rights. This would uh, need to include accessible, trustworthy information on the break even points for popular technologies. It could include sustainability footprint calculators, bringing together everything we know from assessments of the true cost of technologies. And finally, 
Many of the science policy briefs purpose policy uh, propose policy action related to specific uh, technologies. Let me name a few. Uh, access to tiny ML, ML is a low power, low cost technology. Molecular farming, metaverse, integrated advanced oxidation for water sanitation, modular 3D printing construction, cement recycling, bioplastics from urban waste, certified biodegradable materials, hydrometallurgy and recycling of electrical vehicle batteries, urban food forests and aquaponics, cooling gaps, bladeless wind power, recycling of face masks, electrification and hydrogen for attaining carbon neutrality, and much more. Ladies and gentlemen, the deep transformation required for the SDGs can only be achieved with rapid scientific and technological change. It is up to us to steer the change into the right direction and minimize potential risks. Going forward, the TFM findings point to areas for the work of the interagency task team and all its interested partners in order to add value and advance understanding in support of decision making. Let us continue this collaboration across disciplines, stakeholder groups and national borders towards a prosperous and sustainable future for all people and our planet. Thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Maria Francesca Spatolisano. Now I pass the microphone to Ms. Ana Cristina Moroso das Neves. She is a vice chairman, uh, sorry, vice chair, UN Commission on Science and Technology for Development. And uh, you have the floor for uh, four minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, good, uh, good, good afternoon. I'm uh, in, uh, in Lisbon, Portugal, so for me it's good afternoon for all of you. I'm very pleased to address the SDI Forum at this session today as Vice Chair of the UN Commission on Science and Technology for Development. This discussion is very timely. Well, as we all know and we just heard, we live uh, at a new revolution around Industry 4.0 technologies where access to artificial intelligence and robotics form its basis. The impact and response to the COVID-19 pandemic have accelerated the dissemination of these digital technologies. This topic is of great interest to policymakers in developed and developing countries. In March this year, uh, the United Nations Commission on Science and Technology for Development convened for its annual session in Geneva. And one of the priority themes was exactly Industry 4.0 for Inclusive Development. The CSTD as the UN's intergovernmental body on science and technology for sustainable development is an impartial and trusted platform where the international community can deliberate these contentious issues. During the discussion in March, representatives of member countries and experts noted that Industry 4.0 in manufacturing can increase productivity, energy efficiency, and sustainability, reducing the environmental impact of industrialization. But the deployment of Industry 4.0 affects the differences in the relative productivity of firms of different sectors and economies and impacts the prospects and structural transformation of developing countries. This change in manufacturing also affects wages and employment opportunities due to differences in skills and prevailing disparities resulting from the social context and personal features such as age, gender, and ethnicity. At the same time, most firms in developing countries are away far from using Industry 4.0. Most are still using analog technologies in their production processes. 
these countries need, need to industrialize first before they can broadly benefit from industry 4.0. The risk is that the slow industrialization and dissemination of industry 4.0 in the manufacturing sector in developing countries would further increase inequalities between countries, replicating the pattern seen in previous technological revolutions. However, and as highlighted in the report of the UN Secretary General on Industry 4.0, developing countries cannot afford to miss this new wave of technological change. Much will depend on national policy responses. Developing countries need to design and implement science, technology, and innovation policies to prepare people and firms for a period of rapid change. And this will require a balanced approach on capacity building while disseminating industry 4.0 technologies in manufacturing. Novel partnerships should involve multiple and different stakeholders. The strategic thinking around industrialization and industrial policies. International organizations and development agencies need to rethink and reorient their delivery of technical assistance and normative work to meet evolving needs of member states. International cooperation and an inclusive dialogue will be indispensable to give an equal voice to developing countries in governing the impact of technological change on societies and the planet, and to devise policies to a smooth technological transfer. Developing countries should embrace Industry 4.0 technologies for leapfrogging, support technology to promote inclusive and sustainable development, design and implement policies to help society to harness benefits and reduce risks, facilitate access to digital technology, improving infrastructure and lowering access costs, design bespoke training programs, especially for women and young people, raise awareness, strengthen regulations to protect consumers' rights and data privacy, and consider the future of work. International collaboration and partnerships are crucial. And the CSTD, the Commission on Science and Technology for Development, is a very useful example of a platform to facilitate a global partnership for science, technology, and innovation for the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Amoroso das Neves. Uh, now we need to move uh, on to the panel discussion of uh, science policy briefs. Um, there will be some slides to, to be shown, we know that. And if time permits, I will follow up with one probing question to, to the panelists, but let, let's see. Well, first place, uh, uh, we have uh, Ms. Roberta Rabelotti, who has actually a slide. She is a professor of economics, Università di Padre, di Pavia, Italia, and you have the floor for um, two minutes, three minutes, sorry. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to be here uh, um, and to share with you some of my recent research work. Let me start from something everybody I think will agree on. The world is in the early stage of techno-economic paradigm transition towards a greener global economy. This paradigm transition may open new green windows of opportunity for latecomer countries to catch up and fork ahead in green sectors. In a special issue of industrial and corporate change with Sholan Fu at the University of Oxford and Rasmus Lema at Unomerit, which was also published as a science policy brief uh, in the 2021 YAT report, and which is based on empirical evidence on the renewable energy industry in China, we address the following two research questions. First of all, do we need a new conceptual framework to understand the determinants of green latecomer development? And secondly, what are the conditions and dynamics of green latecomer development? So the answer to the first question is definitely yes. We do need a new conceptual framework. And this is because a latecomer 
uh, economies should from the outset develop differently from advanced countries. They should not follow and quickly abandon the grow first and clean up later model. So we propose a framework based on three pillars. First of all, green windows of opportunities, which are different from previous exogenous windows of opportunities created by technological changes or market changes from which started catch up processes in sectors such as mobile phones or steel production. Green windows of opportunities are mainly endogenous, and this implies that they can be created by governments and influenced by domestic and global environmental and industrial policy. Just to make some example from China, I can refer to the Gold Sun, then, uh, Golden Sun Demonstration Program or the Ride the Wind Program. The second pillar of the, of the, of the analytical framework is uh, the necessity to have a sectoral system of production and innovation because the green windows of uh, to exploit the green windows of opportunity, uh, it's uh, needed. Uh, pre there are needed preconditions, and uh, there are needed responses of firms and other public and private actors. And moreover, strategies do also depend on the maturity of technologies and on the tradability of the different tradability of green technology. So, for instance, is there, the tradability is very different from a solar panel air and a wind turbine. So let me come to the catch-up trajectories and please uh, share my slide. So the, the catch-up trajectories are the result from the interaction from wind, green windows of opportunities with the stakeholders action and responses. And in the slide you can see we have depicted the um, different trajectories which uh, different industry we have investigated in China have been following. Uh, solar photovoltaic, hydro, wind, biomass, and concentrated solar power. And catch up is based uh, and measured based on uh, technological catch up and market catch up. And as you can see, all the industry apart from wind have reached the uh, top uh, right uh, quadrant. So it means they have, that China has been able to catch up in this industry both from the technological point of view and from the market uh, point of view. Unfortunately, I do not have the time to enter into the details of each trajectory, but I would like uh, uh, to, um, to remind the specificity and the unique characteristics of China, uh, which has, uh, first of all, a very large domestic market. So uh, to conclude, I would like to mention that we are now working uh, with ANTAD for uh, the next uh, ANTAD Technology and Innovation Report to explore the feasibility of this uh, uh, analytical framework beyond China and across the Global South. We have already found some very interesting examples of countries at different levels of development able to take advantage of green windows of opportunity, but of course there are other countries with sufficient and uh, um, uh, appropriate con precondition, but for instance, with very weak strategic responses, which are needed to size uh, green windows of opportunity. So the evidence we have collected is very varied. And if you would like to know more, I invite you to stay tuned on the next ANTA the Technology and Innovation Report. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ravelotti. And certainly we are tuned to, to, <laughs> to seeing what, what's next. Um, now it's the turn of uh, Dr. Bartolome Kodolsievski. Uh, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Kodol uh, I'm thank you, Jose Ramon. <laughs> great, to, great to reconnect with you after uh, many yeah. years. <laughs> thank you for That's having right? me and thank you, thank you for giving me this opportunity to, um, to talk today. Um, Look, as we transition from fossil fuels to renewable um, energy, we need to ask ourselves how much better these new solutions are. There is a big carbon and environmental footprint associated with manufacturing of solar panels, wind turbines and batteries. Um, despite that, um, these technologies are still better than fossil fuel alternatives. What we are, however, lacking is um, circular economy of these uh, 
wind turbines, batteries, solar panels, among other um, you know, clean technologies. With um, exponentially growing lithium, nickel, and cobalt prices, circular economy is slowly becoming um, a re reality in uh, battery space. Um, companies are emerging in the US and, uh, and Europe that are aiming to um, recover and reuse materials from spent batteries. It is not only possible, but uh, with raw material prices at all times high, it is also becoming very profitable business. This uh, recycling and recovery will likely be uh, decentralized. So uh, that means that uh, you know, it will be uh, focused around smaller kind of uh, localized hubs. Instead of shipping spent equipment to large manufacturing hubs, we can spare further CO2 from shipping and do it uh, locally while providing local jobs. Most of this renewable equipment um, is not designed for recycling. So that's one consideration. We also need to establish um, you know, recycling standards and introduce policies. Uh, there is also potentially a space for governmental incentives for, um, for early movers. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for this very complex. Yeah, I try to be really fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Being mindful uh, of time. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, I pass on the microphone to Ms. Reham Al Tamime, uh, Qatar Computing Research Institute, Hamad bin uh, Khalifa University, and uh, you have the floor, Mal. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to to uh, present today. So today I'm going to present our work on leveraging online advertising data for measuring the sustainable developing goals, application for gender gap, and sustainable developing goal number five. There's a need to better monitor the progress toward the realization of sustainable developing goals. And this need has led to concrete call for a data revolution, including the need to harness non-traditional big data sources. Here we describe how a novel stream of big data, aggregate, anonymous Allah advertising audience estimate provided by companies such as Facebook can help fill existing data gaps and provide real-time estimates of sustainable developing goals in relevant indicators. We focus on sustainable developing goal number five, which seeks to promote gender equality and promote the empowerment of women and girls. Uh, online, uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. Online advertising is the main revenue source for large online platforms and social media companies. During the process of setting up an advertising campaigns, Facebook provides advertisers with services to choose their audience and manage ad budgets. As an example, as you can see from the screenshot here, it's Facebook Ads Manager. On the right side, you can see the audience that you can reach when targeting female Facebook users located in Rwanda, aged between 13 and 65 plus. Similar interfaces are provided by other advertising platforms such as Google, LinkedIn, and Snapchat. So the supporting targeting criteria differ by platforms. These estimates are available in real time and can be filtered by age, gender, location, as well as other characteristics. Some platforms, particularly Facebook, report the estimates of the daily number of users, daily active users, and monthly active users. Daily active users are defined as the estimated number of people that can be reached in the past days, while the monthly active users as the, as are defined as the number of the people that can be reached in the past month. Here we describe how we use this advertising data for two different case studies. Um, uh, can you move to the uh, second slide, please? Uh, in the first case study, we used adver uh, Facebook advertising data for measuring global gender disparities in internet use and mobile access. In this line of research, we focused, we compared internet gender gap index computed by data provided by the International Telecommunication Union, ITU, as you can see in figure A, with internet gender gap index computed by data provided by Facebook advertising data, as you can see in figure B. We found that Facebook data can be used to predict internet gender gaps for a large number of countries, especially in South Asia and Africa, for which no gender gap data from ITU are available. In the second case study, we looked at how online advertising data can be used in a more fasting, a hum a moving humanitarian situation, where real-time data are useful, but when standard forms of data collection are unavailable. In particular, we collected Facebook daily active users in Afghanistan, 
which as you know, as you know, uh, in August 2021 experienced a collapse of its Western back, backed government following the fall of Kabul to the Taliban forces. We had a couple of questions. Firstly, how did the return of the Taliban government, known for its hostility to women's social, economic, and political participation, impact on women's participation online? And did the potential increase in offline restriction arising from political events result in further retreat of for, uh, women online? Or did social media prov uh, uh, provide platform for new type of social mobilization and expression? Uh, we found that at the beginning of the Taliban offenses, we had witnesses, we have witnessed increase in social media activities in Facebook among adolescent girls aged between 15 and 19, to a level not seen in the recent past. Uh, this is still ongoing work, but this is uh, a summary uh, of, uh, of how we um, uh, use advertising to monitor sustainable developing goals, number five relevant indicators. So uh, please move to the next slide where I can conclude. So um, um, in summary, please, uh, if you're interested to know more, please check the report and don't hesitate to get in touch if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Altamime. And now I pass on the floor to uh, Professor Marco Zenaro, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for the invitation. So I think we all agree that AI can play an important role in reaching the SDGs. However, its adoption and impact in many countries are limited by three main factors. The immense power consumption, the strong connectivity requirements, and the high cost of cloud-based development. In a world where, as we heard, half of the world has no access to the internet, connectivity is an important limiting requirement. So TinyML is a new technology that allows machine learning models to run on low cost, low power microcontrollers. So the TinyML process flow is the same as the classical machine learning one, but the inference takes place on the embedded device. This means that there are no connectivity requirements and that privacy is guaranteed. These devices are also extremely low power and can cost less than a dollar. To widen access to this technology, in the brief, we present an initiative carried out by the STI unit of UNESCO's International Center for Theoretical Physics in collaboration with Harvard University to support a global network of academic institutions working on TinyML in developing countries. We now have 20 universities in the network and we're expanding to 20 more. We already organized five training activities last year and we're planning more this year. The first projects with social impact are being developed. For example, our waterborne cholera detector has been developed by network members in Rwanda and can be deployed in remote, unconnected areas. One last comment about ethical issues in tiny machine learning. As these devices are, have no internet connection, it is even more important to take ethics in consideration already in the design phase. So the UNESCO recommendation on the ethics of AI is a valuable guide in this regard. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Zenaro. Um, now I will say a few words um, uh, about uh, what I have been working on in recent uh, uh, times uh, within the G10 of the TFM. Well, rapid technological uh, progress makes uh, frontier technologies coming upon us ever faster, changing practically every aspect of human life and their applications. So the question is how to create necessary dynamic capabilities to respond to emerging science and frontier technologies and to effectively guide STI for SDG roadmaps in an inclusive, articulated, homogeneous, scalable, equitable, and systemic manner to better support uh, innovation ecosystems and the culture of creativity. Um, this has to be done, of course, from the bottom up and from the top down. Well, within the, uh, the G10, uh, I've been working on a guidebook that uh, proposes the creation of a global network of national banks and ideas, uh, uh, yeah, national banks of ideas and funds for innovation led by autonomous ethical councils. Um, the, the draft guidebook reflects uh, on how the UN can contribute to foment a more responsive STI for SDG ecosystem in each country. 
The characteristics of such banks of ideas and funds for innovation make them ideal mechanism uh, for the following tasks. Build an inst and institutionalize an ecosystem for innovation oriented towards an inclusive and sustainable development, generate human capital and governance to strengthen national technological capabilities and promote ethical, uh, competitive and inclusive impact entrepreneurship. Influence and mobilize governments, businesses, and multi-stakeholder community towards an innovation strategy for the SDGs. Empower countries to make the most of existing technologies, best practices, and promising collaboration. Encourage countries to take a leap forward in their development, uh, absorbing and adapting technological change, increase collaboration and value creation on a global scale, avoid or minimize the negative impact of uh, uh, frontier technologies while maximizing their extraordinary potential to achieve the SDGs, guide the acquisition, absorption, adaptation, reproduction, scaling up, and deployment of existing cutting edge technologies and ideas, creating the conditions for technological leapfrogging, systematize the generation, legal protection, effective ex execution, management, support, and financing of best ideas and innovation projects, this is from ideation and research to prototyping, proof of concept and uh, commercialization in accordance to the best international practices and examples. Establish uh, a repository of the identification of solutions and opportunities open to all stakeholders and innovation sponsors, which the private sector could seize, thus generating market value and economic opportunities where there were none within the SDG framework. Finally, create a rich source of information regarding the innovators, which who the innovators are, uh, which are their main interests, capabilities, weaknesses, degree of collaboration and accessibility to financing and public support. Well, the draft is now available. And of course, input is, is always very useful because this has to be, I believe, a, a, a global effort where some uh, key uh, pilot uh, countries could help uh, perfect this, this uh, idea. Now we have um, three perspectives and responses, uh, two min minutes uh, each. First of all, Mrs. Saif uh, Savage from Mexico, Assistant Professor, Northeastern University, Boston, uh, Curie College of Computer Science. You have the floor, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Lo um, Dr. Lopez Portillo. It's such a great honor to be here. So today I will be presenting a little bit about some of the technology, the AI-based technology that we have been developing in Mexico to empower mm -hmm. rural workers. So we created a collaboration between the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM, and also Mexico's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as well as industry actors, particularly the digital labor platform of Toloca. We have been developing AI-based tools that help rural adults to be able to develop their digital skills so that they can access online jobs on digital labor platforms such as Toloca. And we haven't been deploying these tools in different rural areas of Mexico. And one of the advantages of these AI based tools is that they help rural adults be able to not have to abandon their hometowns because now they can find jobs online and they can stay within their hometowns. We are teaming up with public libraries to provide rural adults with spaces where they can rapidly access Internet and be able to use our AI based tools that guide them to get on these digital labor platforms to find new types of jobs online. We're also integrating culture theory to develop the tools so that they are adapted to the culture of these rural regions, which many of them involve indigenous communities and a lot of them also involve women because women are the ones who stay in these rural communities and so we're developing the tools to be adapted to the needs of working women who involve also a lot of mothers and involve also developing the tools so that they adapt to the changing schedules that these women might have um, and i'm very interested and excited about collaborating with all of you please reach out in case you're interested i think that a key part of our research is being able to develop technology with the combination of universities, for instance, UNAM, 
government, uh, for instance, Mexico's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and these industry actors through which we can connect the rural workforce with, such as the platform of Toloca. So thank you very much. It was such a great honor to be here. Uh, thank you very much. I will certainly uh, know more about it. I'm I'm going to Mexico uh, the, the tomorrow, so I will I will hopefully find someone there to tell me more about your project. Um, um, now I pass the floor to Professor uh, Jiahua Pan from uh, China, a member of uh, IGS for the Global Sustainable Development Report, member of the Chinese Academy of uh, Social Sciences. Director of the Institute of Eco Civilization Studies and Professor of Economics, Beijing University of Technology, Editor in Chief of the Chinese Journal of Urban and Environmental Studies. You have the floor. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Really uh, a great opportunity to learn and uh, you know to share uh, you know the uh, knowledge. It's very much encouraged. Uh, you know, to learn that uh, we have solutions, in particular the emerging uh, technologies, uh, emerging sciences and the frontier technologies, you know, provide the solutions, you know, for uh, promoting uh, sustainable development and uh, to uh, achieve, like, uh, you know, the climate change area carbon neutrality. Um, and, you know, the digital and AI technologies are very much encouraging as well. I do believe that they, do, they, they, they are very useful, you know, to promoting the processes. And to my understanding, I think that, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, emerging sciences and the frontier technologies are very much, you know, useful uh, in the near or somewhat in the longer term, but in the near term, I think that in, in the developing countries, uh, the, you know, information and the capacity buildings are vitally important. Otherwise, you know, people are not aware of such, you know, uh, technologies. And the other thing I would like to, to, to um, share uh, with you is, is that, uh, you know, we, um, need to you know to make use of the practical and the matured technologies they are very simple but they are very uh, you know uh, very helpful and useful i can give you one example that is the sonar water heating uh, sonar water heaters is very simple there is no subsidy there's no you know, complex technology, but uh, it uh, works very simply. And uh, you can see, you know, in uh, many university dormitories in uh, the rural areas, uh, on top of the roof, you have uh, the solar water heater, and then you have, uh, you know, water heating, that's uh, nature-based solutions. And the other thing is that, you know, solar, you know, PV on top of your roof, you can have, uh, you know, solar PV, to generate electricity for your own use and for charge uh, your uh, you know cars vehicles and then you know you know it's, it's so something you know you don't have to, to be that complex and for you know simple solutions uh, you know such technologies may you know work uh, for the uh, less uh, uh, you know developed countries. I think that you know that's all I can uh, you know respond and share here. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Yahua Pan. Uh, now I give the floor to Dr. Gabriela Wurzel uh, from Switzerland. Uh, she's uh, from uh, FMC Corporation Business and Industry Major Group. Uh, please, the microphone. Thank you very much, Dr. Lopez Portillo. I am delighted to speak here today on behalf of FMC and be part of such an impressive group of speakers. Um, FMC is an agricultural sciences company committed to helping farmers grow food, feed, fiber, and fuel in a way fully consistent with UN SDGs. Science and technology is at the core of our company. And we have innovative solutions, including biological, crop nutrition, digital, and precision agriculture, all of which we are convinced are essential parts of achieving the sustainable future and the SDG goals. Um, the discussion today uh, 
focuses on emerging technologies on the need for these technologies to apply to everybody and the need for stakeholder, multi-stakeholder partnerships. And I couldn't agree more. I'd like to focus specifically on agriculture. I believe healthy food systems depend on sustainable agriculture from farming practices that reduce emissions and conserve natural resources to products that improve soil quality and prevent food loss and waste. We in FMC are making significant investments in R&D and digital and precision agriculture uh, to enhance agricultural productivity and contribute to a more resilient and sustainable food system. A new generation of farmers equipped with smartphones, field monitoring systems, and GPS guided equipment is actually shaping the future of agriculture globally. Digital and precision agriculture technologies help farmers better protect their crops while using less energy, water, and traditional inputs. To share an example, our Thrive 3D application technology uses 90% less water than alternative systems and can reduce carbon emissions from product application by up to 80%. So uh, I could only uh, echo my, my colleagues in this group to say that government, civil society, and private sector are all fundamental, and we should all contribute to the SDG goals working together. And we are very, very much willing to do so. So please do reach out. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Well, this has been a fantastic uh, uh, set of uh, initiatives and discussions and concepts and experiences. Uh, and now we have um, a session of Q&A of around 10 minutes based on questions raised. And the panelists who, uh, would, um, who, who would want to, to, to speak uh, could um, uh, choose one or two questions. Um, do we have the, the questions, by the way? Uh, Um, well, uh, would, would the panelists uh, respond to uh, to the uh, discussions, or, or or throw any ideas of uh, uh, about we have uh, what we have now uh, raised? Dottora Spatolisano, any ideas? Uh, any suggestions? I, have, I cannot see any, any specific questions. Here I am, here I am. Here and I, am. Uh, I have to say that the uh, level of technological knowledge shared in this panel is, is really impressive. And I commend once again you and the TFM for, for this, uh, you know, new uh, ideas you are sharing and, and new initiatives you are proposing. Um, I am afraid I am not qualified enough to comment on all this, but uh, as you went, what we can do is offer this space for the exchange of these ideas and try to, you know, see how doable, how, impactful they are in order to achieve the SDGs. And I think we heard a lot of good ideas and, and this is uh, what uh, the follow-up will be, see how they can be developed and implemented. So that is my contribution at this stage. Uh, but I'm sure among you scientific community, you, you <laughs> have more questions than I can even imagine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will ask first, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Spatolisano, and, we, and yes, really, you are a focal point to, to uh, move forward in, in this regard. And uh, so we will take your, your word in, in, in this sense. Um, I first ask uh, uh, Dr. Amoroso Das Neves if, uh, if you have, madam, any, any, any comments? Maybe. Um, well, maybe, maybe, maybe she, she disconnected. In, anyway, uh, does anyone else have um, an issue, question, a further concept? Uh, anyone wants to raise their hands? I know it has been very intensive and really 
uh, very uh, technical there to some extent what has been presented here and, uh, and that only someone who would know more uh, could uh, uh, further explain what has been said. But uh, I think this experience tells us about the enormous diversity of initiatives uh, at, at all levels in all countries and, uh, and that we can move forward. And the collaboration is certainly sought by, by everybody. And uh, now the, the big problem, and this is what we have been thinking within the, the G10 and with DESA, how do we put this all together? How do we move forward in the most effective, collaborative, coherent way. And uh, because all these ideas, they, they can flourish in one country, but they can represent also solutions in another. So how do we, how do we need this network you know, of, of, of efforts? How do we, do we share uh, information in a homogeneous way? How do we empower people, particularly vulnerable groups, uh, to, to, to do more to solve their problems? How do we create value in markets that don't exist, in circumstances that, that, that don't uh, offer any attraction to uh, private investors? But there are many funds out there, and there are many ideas out there, and there are many initiatives out there. How do we put it all together? I mean, we must start somehow, and there's no other organization like the United Nations to do this. Yes, there is the WEF, which is more or less a club for the rich. I'm, uh, I mean, I'm not criticizing, I'm part of it, but it, 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 vulnerable communities are not part of, of it. And they are not represented there. There are many other international institutions, but the only one that is comprehensive of all stakeholders is the United Nations. And they have access to funds, they have access to information, et cetera. They are underfunded, it is true, and this is a, a big mistake, and we have said it so many times, but we must think, all of us, please help uh, uh, to, uh, to put, it, put this all together and to collaborate. This is within the framework of the SDGs. It doesn't entail big geopolitical uh, 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 or supremacy uh, interests or, or, or big corporation private uh, innovations. No, this is putting together what exists, technological uh, 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 breakthroughs and, and frontier technologies and traditional technologies. How do you put it together to innovate for the sake of all of humanity in an inclusive and sustainable way. Sorry to, to have uh, now talked a little bit too much, but no, no one was uh, contributing any further thoughts. And uh, uh, I think you, you can help us. I mean, you, you have been tremendously vibrant and, 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 and uh, exciting, at least, to, at least to me. So if you can um, just look at, at what has been produced and, and, and contribute, it would be really of great help. Um, I yeah, know, I, Alex. Yeah, please, please. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I'd, uh, I'd like to echo, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Chair's point. I think that, uh, you know, we need to, uh, you know, integrate. Uh, we need to, uh, you know, have everything, you know, in a systematic manner. You know, there's no single one bullet, uh, silver bullet, and there's no panacea. So we need to uh, get everything together. We have the we need the uh, need to have the technologies, so, but also we need to have the institutions, public awareness, you know, everything together. If there's only one technology and then you know there's no institutions to support to implement, I think that you know, we are not you know functioning. So I think that this is very important to integrate, uh, you know, to get things done in a systematic way. The other thing is, uh, you know, about the uncertainties, like, you know, in the uh, climate change, you know, uh, you know, area I've been working with, that is, you know, we have a new sort of, you know, um, idea that is solar radiation modification in case, you know, we go overshooting and then this might be, you know, a uh, last resort or a potential technology, but the uncertainties and the risks are really unknown. So that in, in such new technologies, emerging technologies, we need to uh, undertake more, you know, research so that we can understand the uh, you know the potentials, the uncertainties, the, the risks much better, so that we can have them deployed whether or not. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Any other comment? Oh, yes. I have uh, Gabriela Wurzel and then Dr. Saif Savage in that order, please. Thank you so much. Um, actually, my my question you 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 may you you pose the question much better than I was going to do it because I was going to ask. So now, what's next, right? We we have this amazing uh, brain power. Uh, the, the 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 people that contributed to these reports are are amazing. The people in this panel is is fantastic as well. So I was wondering, so how do we canalize this into something concrete? That was one of my questions. The other um. Point I wanted to touch upon is, um, I think at the beginning, uh, a couple of speakers mentioned the public policies. So how uh, governments need to adapt these policies or create rather policies for, for, for technology that doesn't exist or, or didn't exist until now um, in order to facilitate that. So that's another point that I retain and maybe it would deserve a bit more of a deeper discussion as well. Thank you. Certainly, thank you very, very much. Uh, Dr. Saif Savash, please. Hey, thank you. Um, I really like the questions that um, Dr. Uh, Lopez Portillo um, stated and also very inspiring to think about, okay, how do we all collaborate? I think a key point is on one hand, creating uh, different net networks that have people from different sectors. And I also think that there's a lot of value in thinking about how do we provide these different actors who come from different sectors with the computational capabilities in order to build. Um, and so here I think that um, the, the work that was presented around um, the, the small ML for facilitating um, and helping the different actors to be able to produce technology with low resources is critical. Um, something that we have been doing at UNAM with Mexico's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and, and other actors is is creating public technological infrastructure through which everyone can access digital technology to start to build and innovate. I think providing those types of technological resources and data as well is key in order to facilitate collaborations and also to facilitate change. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really hope you can have a look at the draft uh, guidebook. And also, as uh, Alex is, is mentioning here, the science policy briefs, which are included in the book, are available on the STI forum website. You can, you can check that. Uh, do, do check the, 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 the chat for, for that, that kind of, uh, of uh, feedback. And um, if, if, if you can read these things, you know, and, and now you know what, what we have said, uh, it'd be very useful to have your feedback. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that uh, DESA would be available to receive this. And uh, maybe we can take the word of uh, Dr. Spatolisano to also become a, a hub, you know, for, uh, for bringing this uh, in a coherent way, and then we can work out how to perfect our our uh, efforts. Um, any any uh, further suggestion, uh, um, Alex? Any anything that you would like to know? I mean, no. Okay. Is there any other contribution? If not, then we are exactly on time to finish this uh, 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 roundtable too. I really thank you very much. It has been tremendously helpful and inspiring. Uh, I'm sure to all of you and certainly to me, and uh, we hope to be in touch and that you contribute uh, more to this um, effort. It cannot just uh, finish here. So uh, with this, um, I close uh, our round table and, um, and hope you can continue whoever is interested to round table three, which will start in a minute. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Portillo, for such a wonderful moderation and uh, to push us to do the best of ourselves. Thank you again. Bye, everybody. Okay. Bye, bye, bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye. bye.